For those that have God's word, I, pray, I trust that you do. We're going to be looking at 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, when we get there. But I wanted to tell you a story. I got a friend. Yes, I have one friend, at least. He's a pastor, probably close to in my age. But he's been doing this a lot longer. He had a prisoner, one of his prayer partners, come up and said, uh, Pastor, I feel that the Lord has given me a word to say, and I want to preach a sermon. He got excited, as us pastors normally do when someone says, hey, I feel the call to preach. Woo, great, like, oh, that's awesome. So he said, all right, well, what are you preaching on? He goes, well, this is what I was going to preach, this is what I'm going to preach on, and it's great, fantastic. I want to hear what your sermon is. I want to see your outline. And, uh, it's all right, not a problem. I'll get it to you. A few days go by. They schedule it. They're going to preach. Four weeks out. All right, great. Plenty of time. Next time you see them. You got that outline? Oh, no, I'm still working on it, Pastor. Next time. You got, you got that outline? Oh, I'm still working on it. Have you nailed down the scripture? Well, I'm thinking. Those are always terms that spark confidence in the pastor. I'm thinking. He gets up there and he says, well. I changed my mind the Sunday up. <laughs> I'm going to speak on this, this topic. Okay, what scripture? Why don't we use a few of them? Okay. He's starting to get nervous, this pastor friend of mine is. This gentleman, they go through their worship service, and they do their prayer, and their altar service is such a great service going, and they're about, I don't know, 20, 25, 30 minutes into it, and the guy gets up there and he says, let's open our Bibles to Genesis 1. We'll start. And his heart, when the pastor started to sink. Then he went to Exodus. He's like, oh no. Two and a half hours later. <laughs> and I wonder, how does someone preach on God's love when the entire book is all about it? Amen. So we're going to start Genesis 1. I'm, I'm joking. I'm joking. Everyone's like, really? We got we to gotta beat, beat the Methodists to, to, uh, to lunch today. But I, I thought about it. How does someone preach or, or talk about God's love when the whole book is about it? Where do we look? What does his love look like? I can tell you all about what he likes in me or what I, what I see his love as. I can tell you how I felt his love. From the moment I met a young lady by the name of Haley Sellers or Haley LaBelle 23 years ago. To the moment of anxiety when she when they said, Do you take this man to be your lovely weather husband? She purposely waited for a few seconds. Felt like about five hours to me. I can tell you all these stories, so I asked you on social media, what does God love love look like? Now some of you, I won't mention names, gave me about five or six to pick and told me to pick one. No, that was not the that was, you pick one. Hmm. Someone said, no need to perform or act. Or put on an act. I can be myself. Faithful. Undeserved. Assurance comes to mind. Unconditional. Hope, grace, forgiveness, mercy, and salvation. Don't know where that came from. Someone just rolled her eyes. I saw it over here. Somewhere over here in this area. You from home can't see that. One said that God's love is the response that it initiates. That his love to this person was the response that it initiated in their life. Wow, that's awesome. His love makes me a child of the king. A fellow pastor of mine said his love is transformation. And then I was hoping to hear from someone that I, I've met a lot of folks since I moved here from the circles of rehabilitation. I have a good brother of mine named Troy that that um, we've worked together in the past and, and handing out food and and uh, he runs a ministry to those that are specializes to people that are have a past in the legal system. That's his ministry. It's what he's called to. And I met this woman in this in this group of folks, and boy, I'll tell you what, she's a she is on fire for the Holy Spirit. This is what she says. God's love resurrected me from a noose around my neck. 
waiting to die to a mighty purpose and a plan to rescue others from drugs and homelessness from the pit of the palace. Glory be to God. Oh, you know what I saw in that one? She's a changed person. I want us to pay attention to the last one. She used words like resurrected, from this to that. Hmm. Let's stand while we look at God's word. Out of 1 John verses, chapter 3, verse 1, and that's all we're reading today. See what great love the Father has lavished on us. Church, say great love. Great love. Say it again, church. Great say it again like you mean it. Great, great love. love. Come on now. That we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world did not know us is that it did not know him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word. Allow your word to be more than words on a page as we pray every single week. Allow that word to come to live in us and dwell within us and change us. Change us to the point where the world does not recognize us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated. Great love. I think this title, I used to put a lot of stock into what the title of a message is going to be, and that changed about seven or eight times. And It's great love. The first thing about it is love is great love. It's, it's bestowed. It's lavished. See, in the NIV, it says lavished. In every other Translation, it says bestowed or gifted. We're in the season of gifts. It's a gift. His love is not something that we sign up for. You don't have to, you know, we're looking for a puppy. You know, one of our puppies died uh, after 17, 16 years. Um, just old. And we've gone through our grieving. We're looking, we want a small puppy. And you know the processes you have to go to adopt a small puppy? From a rescue, more than we've paid in the last three dogs that we've rescued from rescues. It's expensive, and you've got like, they, they want to know who your boss's name is. I'm sure a lot of them were laughing when I put God. <laughs> um, they want to know what your office phone number is and the um, phone number to your off, to your boss. And I said, well, Genesis 1 1 starts it out. But the, the, there's no application for this gift. Like where many parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles are going to express their love to their children in this week. Their, their, their kids didn't have to fill out an application. Boy, that would have been fun. Fill out an application, kids. See, I've got, I heard some laughs from moms. My, my daughter's eyes just rolled. They don't have to perform. I remember growing up as a kid. November comes. Boy, we were on our best behavior because we thought mom and dad were just old and they forgot everything paid forward November 1st. Um, now it's all I can do to get a week out of them. Give me a week of good behavior. There's no, there, there, it does come at a cost. But it's free. See, Ephesians, Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, Paul states, for by grace you have been saved through faith and it's not of your own doing. It is a gift from God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. First John 4.10 says that in this is love. That not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us. And he sent his son to be that appropriation for our sins. It's his love, his gift to us. And that same love that he gives us, we need to give out. I'm just quiet on that one. I want you to picture the person you don't get along with. His love that he gave us, we need to give out. They don't have to earn it. They don't have to fill out paperwork for it. See, it's available for all. This gift is open for everybody. It doesn't mean that everyone's going to get it. No. The path is narrow. Few will find it. But John 3.16 uses that whosoever term. If you're not familiar with that that this is the one verse that everyone memorizes when they first start going to church. For God so loved the word that world that whosoever believeth in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. That whosoever, that's me. Are you a whosoever? Raise your hand if you're a whosoever. Look at all those hands go up. I'm a whosoever. Whosoever believes in me. 
But see, if you keep reading, there's a condition to that love. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God that remains on him, it's a choice. It is up to you to receive. Just like I'm sure the kids have a choice. I don't think they realize this, but they're sitting down at Christmas morning. They, they can choose to say, I don't want to look at this present. I'm going to pass that one up. I'm sure that there's, on hindsight, there's presents that we wish we would have passed up. Favorite gift I've ever gotten. I was asked in one of the polls from a lot of us pastors. We're, we've, learned, we've moved to the digital industry when it comes to research now. We want to hear from the people. And then one other pastor friend of mine in a different denomination asked, well, what's the, what's the most memorable gift that you've ever gotten? Not your favorite, the most memorable. And I remember as a child, probably around Simon's age, and there's this huge box. I mean, it was ginormous. I could fit in this present. Couldn't touch it. I, I tried looking around it. I get hit in the back of the head. And they put it, my mom and dad put it out like weeks before. I swear the thing was underneath the Christmas tree five years before Christmas. And every day, I go in and look at it. And all my sisters were jealous. It was the last gift I got to open. Oh, I was, I was excited. I went through that paper like nobody. Oh, I was so excited. It was a comforter. It was a comforter. Thanks, Mom. Appreciate it. It'll keep you warm. We're in the South. It's hot. Comforter. Most memorable gift. See, hindsight says I could have bypassed that one. I got to something else. But see, the gift has to be received. We have to say, yes, Lord, I want this gift. See, I want this gift. I desire it. That's why a lot of times we'll call you to the altars. We want you to make that, that proclamation saying, yes, Lord, I am putting myself down. We're going to go into a, moment, a time of revival over the next eight weeks. And the first step is defining what it is. We have to accept, we have to come to that humility, that point of humility. See, that Jesus Christ started. He could, he's God. He could have come in any form, any fashion, any family. He came in humility. Hmm. There's no transaction, no requirement. Paul's, Paul's, in Paul's love letter, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, it bears no records of wrongs suffered. doesn't matter what we've done or where we've come from or what we've, what we've turned ourselves into be. We can accept that gift at any point. I'm going to say that again. This is, this is something that I hear a lot. Well, I don't feel comfortable coming to church yet, Pastor. I still have this in my life. I don't care. Because how old are you? Well, 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 I'm old. And you still haven't gotten rid of it on your own? Is that not a hint? Come to church. It's not a place for the holy. It's a hospital for the sinner. See, because we're not, I'm not a physician. No one here is a physician. We serve a great physician. He's the one that does the changing. You have to make that set. Well, I got to get my life in right. No. See, that's the thing about the gift. It's, it's available for all. You have to make that step. I can't make it for you. I've made that step before. Well, you've also made the step to step away. You have to make that step back. See, his great love made us children. Great love. We've talked about the word, uh, the biblical term of adoption. Adoption is just like it is nowadays, like, like natural born children nowadays. See, back in this time, when you were adopted, you had full rights. You had a stake in the inheritance. Oh, let me tell you about the inheritance of my king. Let me tell you about the inheritance of my Abba. And I got to thinking about it, this adoption is a little bit more than legality. See, we can, I can adopt a child who looks absolutely nothing like me. And I look into this, this congregation of a lot more than what we had last year. We don't all look the same. Thank goodness. You're a good looking crowd, by the way. But we're all made in his image. Just like our own children have traits and, and, and image 
I reflections of, our, of mom and dad. We are all made in his image. It's almost like he made us to adopt us. Let's think about that one for a minute. But see, with an adoption, you got to have two willing parties. John 1, 12 says, All who receives him as Savior, believes in his name, follows him, receive the right to be called children of God. I am a child of God. Can you say that this morning? I am a child of God. <laughs> Just to think of what that means to be called a child of God. I am a child of the Almighty. Doesn't mean we have it easy, but boy, it means we have an assurance, don't it? Amen. That was one of those words that was given. An assurance and a reassurance, actually. That person said assurance and reassurance. I won't call that person out because they listed about five or six different times. At least they only listed one thing, but five or different, different times. It was, I was humorous to, to read over those responses. It was assurance and a reassurance. Hmm. I am a child of God. So Genesis does tell us that we were made in his image. Purposefully in his image. We have full right to that inheritance. Oh, that inheritance doesn't come by a, a savings account. It doesn't have to worry about an old property we need to sell. Isn't that right, Haley? His inheritance is, is everlasting life. But a speck than what we experience here. Everlasting life. Romans 8 38 through 9 says, tells us nothing can separate us from his love. Nothing will separate from a share in his estate. All we gotta do is accept it. All we gotta do is say, Yes, Lord. Here I am humbly. I need you to do the changing. We have full rights to that inheritance. His great love, the last point tonight, is his great love. It separates us from the world. And I look back at this, and I'm like, that's the part a lot of us don't mention. My sister, who talked about how her chains were broken, she, she said she was redeemed from that life. She was separated from that life. And I look at what the Word says. The world does not know him. The world does not owe us because it does not did not know him. We are different. When I first got here, reconnected with a buddy from college, and he asked me, "What's what's been going on?" You know, he, I remember he, he, you're still married to that girl that you met in. Yeah, still married to that girl. She still makes puppy chow? Well, that's sweet. So I'm like, yeah, she still makes puppy chow. We got to talking. Well, what are you doing with your life right now? He's still in that small Georgetown home. Just started my first pastoral in Washington, Indiana. Washington State? No, Washington, Indiana. Where? So, a couple of weeks gone by, and he messaged me up. You're different. Yeah, I'm not the same person that we that was your roommate in college. I am different. I'm separated from the world. See, he did that on purpose. Blessed are those who are persecuted for my sake, he says. He was rejected by his own people. If you, John 1, 1, 11 said that he was rejected by his own. He couldn't go back into his own hometown. Ever feel that way? Your home was good to visit. But you realize you don't do the same things that you used to do back when you're back when you were that age. I find that high school reunions are hard, so they just don't go. John was referring here to is that when when we truly are obedient and we truly make that decision to come down the aisle and humble ourselves at the altar of our Almighty King, He changes us. He makes it to the point where we are uncomfortable doing what we used to do. We can't do it anymore. It's not that it's not that we're, we're judgmental or, or shame on you for doing it. I just don't. I can't do it. See, I have a history with alcohol myself. I can't go into a bar and witness. There are some folks that can, and God bless you for doing so. I can't. 
It doesn't feel right to me. He changed me. And you know, he said, the old is gone, the new is here. If he forgives me from, from my sins, as far as the east is from the west, what business do I have to go back and remember? Hmm. See, there is a very plain distinction here. It's a left and a right, a right and a wrong. There is heaven and hell here. He tells us to be of the world, not in the world. Or in the world, not of the world. You can live in your in your world. Don't part you don't have just because it's legal. Well, that's that's just, it's accepted now. Everybody's doing it. Mm. Peter 4, 3 through 4 tells us to be in the world, but not to fall to the desire of sin that controls the world. See. We are called to be separate. When you make that choice, we are called to be separate. Does the normality of society seem awkward to you or offensive? It should. If it doesn't, something here has to change. I can't change it. Only my Savior can. Does it feel awkward to you? To experience the things that used to bring you joy? Good. That's a mark of holiness. See, a lot of people don't want to talk about holiness because they think that we're, we're better than no. I'm not better than anybody. Absolutely not. I'm just changed. I'm not done being changed. Thank goodness I'm not done being changed. Does that mean my time is done? I'm up. It's over. If there's nothing he can do with me, there's no more he can change in me. He's not going to keep me on this planet. The simple fact that I'm here, the simple fact that I get to experience and see the change that God is making in many of your lives, just like Brother Don said, it's fun to watch. I'm not ready to go home. I'm not going to run from it. But man, if I go home now, I'm going to miss a lot of good stuff. He tells us to seek the lost, to go into the world that we're separate from. That doesn't mean we're not to. We're not, we're not supposed to stay away from those people. No, we're, we're supposed to bring those people in. You feel, if someone in, your, in the church makes you feel uncomfortable, good. Get used to it. Because I want a whole bunch of those folks. You know, one of the things I love about my brother Troy, who has that ministry to those that, are, that want that second chance, you get to hear those testimonies. I see, I thought I was broken. <laughs> it's humbling to see that these folks that are in the middle of their brokenness and in the middle of God rescuing them, and they still have something to shout about. They still have something to praise about. They want to be separate from the world. They have a desire to be separate from the world. See, his love is great. His love is a great love. It's available. It's a gift. It, bestow, it makes us his children. And it separates us from the world. I'm going to ask the, the worship team to come on up. It separates us from the world. But yet we're still charged with responsibilities as Christians. We had the opportunity to kind of um, partner with another organization or sorority and some made some donations and we were able to take care of one of our own. It is time to start showing our love to the community. It's time to Reach out to the people across the street and next door and let them know that they're loved. But what can we do? I've been praying a lot about this. I'm going to call it a manger fund until someone decides that they want to rename it. And I want to say thank you for your faithfulness and giving. I don't mention much about tithes and offerings. We do take them. And for those that are watching online, we have a post office box you can send them to. We take our tithing offerings in the back. 
What I'm mentioning to you tonight is today is a major fun. There's something over and above. See, we have a faith promise that we reach out to the world and I give to that regularly. It's going to be over and above that, which is over and above my tithing offering. But we're going to collect on that manger fund. Again, you want to call it something different, by all means, you come see me. I need people to, to gather around, to be part of a team, to say how we're going to use this manger fund in December. Because we're going to put it in the bank, we're just going to let it pile up. And we're going to go love on people. We're going to go into the world, friends. We don't have to be of the world. But to love the world, we have to go into the world. We don't have, we are separate from the world, but that doesn't make us better than the world. See, I, I love my father so much that I want the people that haven't experienced what I, the love that I got to experience it as well. It starts with humility though. And Don didn't know that my favorite Christmas tune is that very last one that we sang. We're going to sing through the chorus a couple times. I kind of went back and forth on how we're going to finish this. And we're now, so now figuring it out. Maybe it's time for you to be humble. Our altars are always open. Maybe it's time for you to give up something in your life. But say, I, I can't do it on my own, Father. I need you to separate me from this world on that, on that point. Lord, I, I've chosen you as my Savior, but I need this one little thing taken care of because I can't handle it on my own. See, it starts in humility. I've never asked people to come up, but I am today. I don't care who's watching. I don't, this is between you and your Maker. This is between you and your Father. This is between you and the God that created you in his image. We're going to sing through this chorus a couple of times. You feel led? Come up. I'll anoint with oil. I'll stand in agreement. You want to share with me what it is? That's fine. My wife is back there ready to kill my mic. She loves that job. Well, let's give it to him. Let's give it to him. Oh, the night, the stars are bright, we shine. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and hell. The soul felt its worth. The thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. For yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. The 
King of kings, thus in a lowly manger, in all our trials, born to be a friend. He knows your need. To our weakness, He's no strength. I'm praying for that person who's watching online that doesn't want mom and dad to hear. I'm praying for that person who's watching online saying, Lord, it doesn't matter what the, who the messenger is, that you are the message. And I want to bend in humility to that message. Lord, I want more of your love. I want more of that inheritance. Lord, I want more of that acceptance. I want more of that reassurance. But it starts with us on our knees. Lord, I'm praying for that person that's bowing, that's on their knees in front of their sofa, the person that's on their knees next to their bedside. Lord, I ask that you just reach them. Lord, go to them. Let them feel your love and abundance. Separate them from the world. Fill them with a life of holiness that only can be described by you and your word, gracious hand. Give them that gift. Father, and then commission them to go out into the world and share that gift. Commission them to go out into the world and to share that same love that you've given us. It is in Jesus Christ's holy name. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to commission you, love someone this week. Love someone this week. They don't have to be like you. They don't even have to know you. Love someone this week. Give them a gift that's indescribable. Give them a gift that is not purchased with funds. Look forward to seeing you at our dropping communion. I love you, and I'm praying for each one of you. Go in peace. Four.